All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So glad to have you here with us today. Uh, whether you've joined us here in person or if you're joining us online, uh, we're thankful in both instances uh, that you've gathered, as we've gathered to worship the Lord Jesus Christ today. And so as we begin to enter into worship, a couple things that I'd like us to pray for is I just want us to center our mind on God and to think about Him. Uh, also, in my opening prayer, I'm going to pray a prayer of confession. And I pray that wherever, you're, wherever, wherever you are uh, with me, that you might pray that prayer with us as we confess our sins to the Lord, knowing that in Jesus Christ we will find forgiveness. So if you would uh, listen first, the, I'm going to read from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 18 to 20. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies. For its maker trusts in its own creation. For he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, Arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there's no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, as we draw near to you this morning, uh, we are aware that we are sinful people drawing near to the presence of the living and true God who is enthroned above the cherubim, who with saints and angels Dwell in heaven right now, and you receive praise from all of them. God, as we draw near to you, we confess our sin to you. God, we confess this, that this past week we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We've sinned against you in the things that we've done and in the things that we have left undone. We have not loved you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, or with all of our strength. We've not loved our neighbors as ourselves. However, we know that your word tells us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and you are just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, God, we do so, uh, knowing that in the name of Jesus we find forgiveness. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray and ask now that you would meet us as we gather to sing songs, as we uh, will pray prayers, as we will listen to the scripture, hear it proclaimed. God, as we give of our tithes and offerings, even later in the service, we ask and pray that you would uh, bless us, that you would uh, meet us, Father. And would you be glorified in all that we say, think, and do. We pray in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Amen. It's good to see everybody here today. Um, Today we're going to sing a couple of songs together. We're going to start with a couple of familiar hymns. First off, All Creatures of Our God and King. So I'd love it if you could stand and sing with me. Let's sing this together. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Thou burning sun with golden beam. Thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thou rushing wind that art so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Thou rising moon in praise rejoice. Ye lights 
of evening find a voice. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. 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 All things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Father, praise the Son. Praise the Son and praise the Spirit, three in one. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Jonathan and Lindsay, thanks for leading us in worship. Those are some of my favorite hymns. I don't know if you know them, but those are two of the oldest hymns that we sing. Uh, uh, All Creatures of Our God and King is a song that is over 700 years old, and it's one that we continue to sing today, and it's so still so beautiful. Um, our sermon today is going to come from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. So if you have your Bibles with you today, I'd invite you to turn there, uh, whether you're reading on your screen or on your, uh, in your Bible. Uh, uh, I'm going to be also referring to 1 Corinthians chapters 5 to 6 today, so you'll want to leave your Bibles open through the sermon. But if you're able and if you found your place in God's holy word, if you would please continue standing or please stand if you're at home for the reading of God's word. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us to impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for uh, this occasion and this opportunity to read your word today, to uh, learn from it. God, I pray that you would give me wisdom as I speak. God, if there is anything I say that is an error, I pray that you would help us to swiftly disregard it. Um, God, this is a very sensitive topic in our society today, and so I pray that you would give me wisdom. I pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. These are the opening words of L.P. Hartley's 1953 novel, The Go-Between. You see, there are a lot of ways we can experience different cultures and customs, and one of them is to travel to distant lands and to faraway places. Uh, Often these experiences can be enlightening because they help us to understand that the way we do things is not the only way, let alone even the best way to do things. In fact, there's a lot we can learn from other cultures and societies. Uh, My grandfather uh, did not go to college. Uh, He was in the Air Force, and uh, just after the Korean War, he served in the Air Force, and he was multiple times stationed in England, and while he was there, he would travel to London on the weekend, or he might even go over to Oxford uh, to run around town there. And what he said, he said, I never had a college education, but that was kind of like my college education, being able to experience different peoples in different places. But it's not possible for every person to take a trip to another country, or even let alone to faraway places within our own country. It's expensive. It requires time and and the ability to go. Uh, But there's one foreign country that we can all visit. And like our quote earlier, the foreign country we can all visit is the past. Right? There's actually a lot of different eras, a lot of different locations we can learn about if we uh, study the past. It means that we often have to read or maybe study cultural artifacts, watch a documentary, uh, but we can learn from ages before us. And whenever we study the past, it can be striking simultaneously how similar certain things can be and how dissimilar things can be, right? It's striking how if we were to go 4,000 years ago and look what people had to do to survive, um, Switch over to our mic, uh, another mic. Having some feedback issues on my microphone. So hopefully you can hear me uh, clearly now. If you go to 2000 BC, people had to plant crops. They had to till the soil. They had to plant the seed. They had to water the seed. They had to pull weeds. They had to harvest the crop. They had to process the crop. We have to do all those things today. Now, we're, we're not as involved, you and I, in that process as they were two, 4,000 years ago. We have some machines that make that process a lot quicker and a lot more efficient. 
However, the same thing is done, right? Even though they didn't have electricity, they didn't have fossil fuels, they still had to grow food. As we journey into the past, we have to be aware of what C.S. Lewis termed chronological snobbery. And that's the belief that our current art, our current thinking, our current science, our current society is better than all previous eras in the past. Right? And that the and I would say not only that our achievements are better, but even that the problems we face are so unique and unprecedented. And it thank God it, you know, we finally came along to fix those problems. So here's what I think we should do. Whenever we face a new problem for us, we should not just think forward, but we should also think backward. Right? Let's take a global pandemic, something that uh, neither you nor I had ever experienced prior to 2020, at least in the scale that we're experiencing it today. Right? We could go back to 1918 and read about the Spanish flu, or we can even go back to the eras in Europe when the bubonic plague or the Black Death was afflict- afflicting society. It's not that we expect to find a silver bullet there, but we can learn from how they responded in those circumstances, and those can inform our response today. Well, another way we might think of today, we might feel like we're living in unprecedented times, is when we think about the issues in our day related to sex and sexuality. I know this topic can be uncomfortable for some, but it's one the Bible addresses. It's one that affects every single one of us and our families. We think about things that maybe 20 and not even 20, but especially 70 years ago or beyond would have seemed just un. Imagine, you know, they, they were not even within our frame of imagination that are totally acceptable now. In 1968, the percentage of young adults between age 25 and 34 that were not married but they lived together in a cohabiting relationship was 0.2%. 0.2%. Today, that number is 15%. Right? Fifteen years ago, if you polled all of the, everyone in America, the majority of Americans, over 50%, were opposed to gay marriage. But today, not only is it the law of the land in a post-Abergefell world, but it even dominates public opinion. 72% of Americans, and especially high numbers of young people, approve of gay marriage. Even whenever I was, a, 10 years ago, whenever I was just out of high school, concepts of gender dysphoria and transgenderism were still hardly imaginable at all. And so some of this new change we have to understand is new. Technology has brought about some of these changes. Because of the internet, a 12-year-old boy today could see more images of naked women and people having sex in one hour than his grandfather would have seen in his entire lifetime. Other changes are structural. So you might think of a young college graduate. They've graduated, they have their bachelor's degree, but they're saddled with tens of thousands of dollars of debt. And they found someone who they really like, but the thought of spending another tens of thousands of dollars, the average cost of a wedding today in Nashville is $23,000. The, fa- the, the thought of spending that much more money on top of the debt they have, knowing that over 50% of marriages end in an even more expensive divorce, that leads par- people to think, well, this just isn't for me. It's not worth the cost. I still love this person but I'd rather not have to bankrupt myself in order to enter into this reality. And this isn't something that solely affects the world. If you talk to people who call themselves Christians today, it seems like the standards on these issues are still changing. Right? It affects people who call themselves Christians. It affects our family members. And so in the face of all of these things, we see so many people departing from the biblical understanding of sex which is that is a gift from God that is to be exercised within a covenant marriage between one man and one woman for life. We distress, and we might think the world has never been so bad. Let's retreat into our homes. Let's retreat into our churches and communities, and let's figure out another way to win back the culture and to change this. But before we get up in arms, I would invite you to journey into the past with me. Let's go into the strange new world of the Bible. And we need to consider two things today. First, what does the Bible teach about sex and sexuality? The second thing we have to consider is, how did God's people live in a holy way with regards to their sexuality in their own day and time? 
So as we come to our own crossroads, that's our series that we're in right now, is whenever God's people come to a crossroads, what are they to do? What are we to do? Well, as we examine the text in 1 Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians today, I hope you'll see this, that although the moral values of the world are constantly shifting, God has not called his people to panic, nor to despair, nor to rearm for another culture war, but instead to serve and worship him in holiness with our bodies and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that one more time. Although the moral values of the world are constantly shifting, God has not called his people to panic, nor to despair, nor to rearm for another culture war, but instead to serve and worship him in holiness with their bodies and the power of of the Holy Spirit. As I begin today, I want to say something. I cannot say enough in the time we have today to cover all that needs to be said. I'm going to leave out something you wish I would have addressed, and maybe I will address things you wish I wouldn't have addressed. But our starting point today is that we are going to learn from God's Word. We take God's Word to be our sole and primary and final authority on these issues with regard in in our life. And so we're not trying to get out from underneath God's word as if we could exempt ourselves from the standard, but rather we want to listen to God. And so the first question that I want us to answer today is what is God's standard for sexuality? What is God's standard for sexuality? Again, I'll read some verses from 1 Thessalonians that I read earlier today. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Paul understands that there's a dissonance between what God expects of his people and what the world, what the culture will accept and practice. And this is where history really helps us. In the Mediterranean world that the Apostle Paul lived in, that the early church was birthed into, we read through the book of Acts, we find locations where there were much more liberal and libertine sexual morals than there are in our society today. That may be hard to imagine. Adultery was a crime. If you cheated on your spouse or if you cheated on someone else's spouse, uh, if you had an affair with someone else's spouse, that was a crime. You could be tried for that. But sex outside of marriage even intimate relationships between older men and adolescent males, these were open and permissible. The public art in the time, even the lamps that people would put in their homes, often had very vulgar sexual acts depicted on them. And worshiping in temples to idols was often involved the act of cult prostitution. So you go to the temple where there are temple prostitutes working there, and in consorting with them, you pay a fee to the temple. It helps fund the, activity, fund the activities there. This was a common practice. This wasn't just a rare thing. And so it's in this context, as Paul proclaims the gospel with these very, again, libertine sexual values, that Paul instructs the Thessalonians that they must abstain from sexual immorality. The sexual ethics of the world were vastly different than the standard that God had for his people. Nevertheless, God still expected holiness. And this is something that he expected them to do, not in their own strength, but in the Holy Spirit's power. It wasn't simply an understanding of sex that was created in opposition to the standards of the world. We see this, therefore we must do the opposite of that. No, it relates back to how God created sex in the first place. And we have to go back to creation. That's why we sang hymns about creation before. In Genesis chapter 1, God created male and female. He created them in his image. And we're told that the woman was created as a complement to the man because there was no other companion of all the creatures that were created. There was no other companion fit for him. And whenever God creates the woman, he gives her to the man, and we read in Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were unashamed. We see this covenantal union as the standard throughout the rest of Scripture, the sixth commandment in Exodus chapter 20 is you shall not commit adultery. But there are other forms of sexual morality prohibited. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus himself says that I command you not just that you shouldn't commit adultery, you shouldn't even lust. Again, we don't have time to paint an entire portrait of the Bible's sexual ethic, but again, we can say that God desires sex. He created sex to be reserved for a covenant marriage between one man and one woman for life. 
Now, we know that sin messes this up, and it can mess it up pretty badly. And it's not something that we should be ashamed about, but rather something that we should celebrate because God gave it to humans as a gift. But like all of God's gifts, they must be applied and used in an appropriate way. And we know that God cares about our acts today. If we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 to 20, Paul's talking about consorting with prostitutes and talking to the Corinthian church why they shouldn't do that. And he says this in verse 16. It says, Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of his body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from your God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. This is a conversation that we can't simply clutch at our pearls and hope that our children and grandchildren never talk to us about. It's not a subject that we should just reserve for gossip in the hush-hushed conversation, but rather we must talk about it. For the sake of truth, we must talk about it. For the sake of our children and our churches, we must talk about it. These beliefs about sex and sexuality, if we look at the history of the church over the last 2,000 years, they are standards which the church has held with remarkable consistency. It's not that there weren't ever dissenting voices here and there, but overall they have understood sex and sexuality this way. But in recent years, there have been many Christians who believe the church should change its position on this issue. And so this is the question we need to ask now. Should we change our position on sex and sexuality? Should we become more lenient on cohabitation before marriage or outside of marriage? Should we become more accepting of homosexuality and transgenderism? Well, I would answer that on the basis of God's word, should we change our standard? The answer is no. God's word has not changed, and neither should our position, unless we're trying to become more consistent with God's word on this topic. Modern sexual ethics has one word that determines what is permissible and impermissible, and that one word is consent. As long as two or even more sober-minded adults consent to a sexual encounter and it harms no one else, then it should be permissible. Regardless of gender, regardless of number, consent is the name of the game. And while I would say consent is necessary to honor God with our sexuality, even within covenant marriage, we have to take into account God's word. And it's not that we want to control anyone's behavior. I don't want to control any man or woman. I don't care if anyone is straight or gay, transgender or cisgender, The reason that I think this is important is because it's spoken about in God's Word. I want to hold to God's Word and tremble at it. As Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that the one who disregards this disregards not man, but God. Disregards not man, but God. And so while the world may ask why the church is opposed to sexuality in certain forms, whether that's homosexuality or transgenderism or even cohabiting outside of marriage and casual sex. Here's one answer that we have to be able to stand by. This this is an answer we can give that will not suffice. Why is the church opposed to this? We can't simply say because it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Well, because the Bible says it's wrong. Well, where in the Bible does it say that it's wrong? I fear that there are a number of Christians who don't actually know what the Bible says on these topics. But there are a number of play texts that address them. One of those is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Note that for Paul, he has this broader category of sexual immorality that is all types of illicit sex that is not permitted by God, and that these are not the only sins that Paul is concerned about. 
If we read in Romans chapter 1, he uses homosexuality as an example of sin, but then he goes on to, down the list and he says, the wrath of God is revealed against all these sins, including gossip, including disobey, di- disobedience to parents. As the people of God, we must be consistent when we talk about this. We can't have a double standard. I've seen more than one Christian who gets angry or even anxious at the acceptance of homosexuality in our society, but is much less anxious about the cohabiting uh, of other Christians and even of their own family members who profess to be Christians who are cohabiting together. I know cohabiting Christians who are anxious about homosexuality, but they are violating God's will with regard to marriage. Brothers and sisters, according to the Apostle Paul, All of these sins put one at risk for missing out on the kingdom of heaven. Another objection you might hear people say today is, well, Jesus never talks about homosexuality. So why do we make such a big deal out of it? There are a lot of things Jesus didn't talk about that we still need to make a big deal out of. In this Jewish society that Jesus ministered in, in the Gospels, homosexuality was already prohibited not in the Greco-Roman society that the Apostle Paul ministered to. So it's not surprising that Jesus doesn't mention it, as he doesn't mention many other sins, not because they were unimportant, but because they weren't dominant in the society that he ministered in. So as we've thought about what the Bible teaches about this, and we've thought about should we change our position as the church, as Christians on this, what should our approach be? Here's the question I want us to answer specifically. Should we retreat from the world? We find ourselves at a crossroads. What should we do? Well, first we have to remember, we need to always remember, that there is always the opportunity for redemption for all sinners, regardless of what they've done in the past. We should not expect people who do not profess to follow Jesus to live holy lives sexually if the rest of their life is not in submission to Jesus, if they've never repented of their sins and placed their faith in him. But we do have hope in what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. But as such were some of you. But you've been changed. Jesus has saved you. He's redeemed you. He's washed you. And so we always need to hold out, hold out hope for redemption and forgiveness. The second thing I think that we need to realize is that we must be compassionate in our response to this. There are many people in the LGBT community who have suffered greatly for the decisions that they've made. We need to understand that one of our compassionate responses needs to be that although this is sinful, the extent of their sin may not be obvious to them. As it is for many of us, for all of us, whenever we sin, it's often not immediately obvious to us that we are committing sin in the moment. So we need to be compassionate on the level of understanding, but also what people in the LGBT community suffer. The rate of depression and suicide for those who identify as transgender is startlingly high. It is not rare for people whenever they come out with their identity, we can question whether or not that identity is valid, but whenever they come out to be kicked out of their parents' home, for them to be cut off from their family, and even at times written out of their parents' will because of their sexuality. As Christians, we can affirm that it is wrong to evict someone from their housing or to fire them from their job just because of their sexual decisions. So we need to be compassionate in this regard. But here's the third thing. We need to, un- we need to recover the Bible's, alternate, al- bi- the Bible's alternate to mon- monogamous sexual union. And the Bible's alternative is chastity. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Jesus even mentioned this in his own ministry. That the alternative to monogamous marriage isn't living a sexually licentious lifestyle, but rather it's to be chaste. And we understand that this is not an easy calling for those who are called to it. But we need to recover it as a norm, a norm that requires the daily dying to self, which is one that we should all do as Christians, dying to ourselves daily in the submission of Jesus Christ. But there's two other approaches that I think would be less fruitful if we engaged in them. One of them is to try to ignite and win another culture war. Right? Sometimes we think about how society has changed in their opinion on some of these issues and think, well, we just need to start another political action committee. We need politicians to talk more and more about this. But frankly, I believe that any attempt to do so, especially in our neighborhood, is an attempt that's doomed to fail. As I mentioned earlier, it is a staggeringly high number of Americans who accept these things. 
Another option that I think would be wrong is if we try to retreat from the world. Let the world do what they will do. We'll just not engage. We're not going to let them in. We're not going to talk to them. But I don't think the Bible lets us do this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, I wrote to you in my letter, a previous letter, not to associate with sexually immoral people, but I wasn't at all talking about the sexually immoral people of the world or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. Since then, you would have to go out of the world. No, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister in Christ if he or she is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. The response to us, and this is where I think we can learn most of all from the early church in the, book, in the Bible, is that although the world may be different, they may disagree with our position on sexuality, God has called us as the people of God to holiness in this regard, to honor him with our bodies in the power of the Holy Spirit. The graver threat is whenever there are those who call themselves Christians who are engaged in this type of behavior. Again, we don't need to shame people. We don't need to get angry at people. But we must live consistently and encourage one another and our brothers and sisters to live in holiness. This is something that we have to be prepared to engage in. Uh, many see this as the next civil rights, in, civil rights issue of our day. And there are going to be so many people who will say that we as Christians are on the wrong side of history. We need to prepare, be prepared to hear that more and more and more. However, what I would say is that if we hold what the Bible says on this issue, that we're not on the wrong side of history, but we are standing with the Lord of history. The Lord who will return. And when he returns, he will desire to find his people be found faithful. And so we need to recommit in our own marriages or to encourage those in our family, especially within our church family, to live in a holy way. Let's commit not to move with every ebb and flow of the tide of culture on this issue, but let us commit to love radically. Not to use slurs against people, not to make up slanderous accusations against people who we believe are living in sin, but rather that we would be honest with them and talk about why we think that lifestyle is harmful and not in accordance with what Jesus Christ would have. Let us share the gospel that the Lord of history became a human for our sake, that our creator became a human, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross. And he didn't stay dead, but three days later he got up out of the tomb. And he beckons all men and women, children and adults, all peoples, to believe him by, and to trust him and to repent of their sins, that they too may have eternal life. Let us begin there. And if we begin there, once someone has believed, then we can help them come along in understanding what the Bible teaches and how we can be found faithful together. If you would, please bow your heads with me and let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we confess, as we come before you now, we confess that this is a topic in which we uh, can oftentimes be confused about. We find ourselves panicking at times. We find ourselves unsure of why the world is moving in the way that it is. God, we confess that there may have been times whenever we did not respond rightly to people whenever they confided in us or told us about their sexual identity. Perhaps we responded in anger or in disgust. Perhaps we tried to shame them. God, would you help us in the future to repent of this, but also to navigate how we can hold fast to your word and the standard that you set forth in Scripture, while at the same time engaging and loving our neighbors. God, if we try to do this in our own wisdom, we are going to fail, and we're going to make mistakes either way. But we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us, that your Holy Spirit would lead us in all truth and would lead us in love. Would you help us to be faithful in our proclamation of the gospel? Not that we just desire people to conform to our moral code, but rather that we would invite them to meet the Lord of the universe who loves them and who gave himself for them. God, we pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. Let's stand and sing together our song of invitation. Sing this with me. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need song to rise to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Like hot potato up here with a microphone. Uh, our scripture reading this morning comes from Exodus 19, verses 1 through 6. So if you would listen, this is God's word to us. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. While Moses went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, This you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. And how I bore you out on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured 
treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, um, again, if you're with us today, I'd like to thank you for joining us. If you're with us online or at home later on, thank you for uh, for watching and worshiping with us. I have several announcements that I want to make uh, before we go. Uh, the first um, is that uh, this coming Wednesday, we are actually not having a Bible study this Wednesday. Um, we, I forget. We, I think we forgot a slide for this. But we are going to have a business meeting this coming Wednesday. Uh, that'll be um, August 12th at 6 p.m. here in the CLC. So um, we are going to, we've emailed the agenda for that meeting. Uh, if you're here today, you've got a copy, and we'll have copies available on Wednesday as well. But we hope to see you here at 6. What that means is that we will not have a uh, Bible study uh, over the conference call this week. Uh, but next Sunday uh, at uh 9 a.m. If you're interested in joining a Bible study, we have several Bible studies that we do here at Dalewood, and you can find information about those at dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash Bible study, dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash Bible study. Um, those are all meeting remotely, but you can join uh, online, if you can find the call-in information at that website. All right. Uh, also, this coming Friday, uh, August 14th, Parents' Day Out is going to resume. Uh, they're going to be set up in the classrooms in the hallway over there. And so um, if you see car a lot of cars here, that that's why. They've got some new socially distanced policies. Um, all the chairs that you see out here now, those will be put away. And then on, um, uh, we'll put those out again after uh, their the kids are done on Friday. So I wanted to let you know about that. Going along with that, this week the hours are changing in the Christian Life Center. Um, so the current uh, the moving forward, as of this coming week, the Christian Life Center will be open Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. All right. And then there are a few ways you can give to the work here at Dalewood. One is you can go to dalewoodchurchnashville.com slash give. You can give online there. You can also mail your gifts into the church at 1586 McGavick Pike, Nashville, Tennessee, 37216. Or if you can't uh, mail it or if you can't access uh, the Internet to pay online or to give online, rather, uh, you can uh, call the church at 615-227-7000. And we can schedule actually a pickup uh, for someone to come by and uh, pick up your tithe and take that to the church. Uh, as we kind of come to a close, I want to share a kind of one care need uh, with the congregation. One, uh, you may have seen this on Thursday. Uh, that our sister June Abney fell Thursday and actually broke her right arm between her shoulder and her elbow. Uh, she went home Thursday afternoon with a sling. And they actually discovered subsequently uh, yesterday that in addition to breaking her arm, she also has a broken hip, uh, the, uh, the opposite hip of the one that she injured last year. And so she is again at St. Thomas Midtown. I believe she's anticipating that they will operate on her and do a replacement tomorrow. Is that uh, that's as far as we know right now. That's what the plan is. So we want to pray for June and encourage her. Um, I know that if uh, if you had some free time and wanted to call St. Thomas and buzz into her room, I know that she would enjoy a call uh, from anyone. So if you would please, let's bow our heads together and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to you now to intercede for uh, our brothers and sisters, we, we want to lift up today June in particular and pray that you would uh, be with her and give her comfort as she's in so much pain uh, in both her arm and her hip. Um, God, we pray that in the in the hospital they're able to alleviate that some. Uh, but we know that for both injuries, it's going to be a long time in recovery, and uh, the presence of one exacerbates the recovery time of the other. And so we pray that as she prepares for the operation tomorrow, that you would strengthen her body to prepare her for this. And as she comes out of it, we just pray that you would continue to give her strength as she recovers. God, we pray for her and all other people who might be in a hospital now or in assisted living or nursing home. We pray for those who are in prison, uh, who are at heightened risk of exposure for the coronavirus. Um, God, we pray that you would keep them safe, particularly our members. Um, we pray that you would uh, be with all of our brothers and sisters who are in this situation. Would you guard them from the coronavirus? And would you help us in our community, God, and our state and nation to uh, decrease the rate of transmission, to decrease the amount of cases that we see. We know that the things are going down right now, and we thank you for that. We pray that this trend would continue, uh, that 
uh, we would be able to um, have such low transmission that even more things can return to normal as we take care ourselves. I pray for those who uh, uh, who have lost work or whose work has been significantly decreased during this time uh, and who are lacking income. We pray that you would provide for them. And again, that you would even show us as your people, as the body of Christ, how we might love and serve our neighbors during this time. Uh, God, I pray that you would be with our government leaders today. Would you be with Mayor John Cooper, Governor Bill Lee, President Donald Trump. Be with all other men and women who serve at any level of the government uh, and, and give them wisdom. We also pray that if there's any who do not know you, that you would bring them to the saving knowledge of the truth. God, I pray for our neighbors this morning, not just those who live in the, pr- in the immediate vicinity of Daywood Baptist Church, not just th- those who live in the immediate vicinity of our homes, but all of those whom you have put in the orbit of our lives, for our friends, for our family, for our co-workers, and those who live in close proximity to us. God, I pray that you would help us to be faithful witnesses to Jesus, to, these pe- to, to all of these people. I pray for those who do not know you, who have, do not worship you or your son, Jesus Christ, who do not trust him, who have not believed in him, that you would work in their hearts now. Start stirring them by your Holy Spirit. Stir them to start seeking for you so that whenever they hear the gospel, they would respond. God, we do desire that our neighbors would come to faith in Jesus Christ and that you would use us as the means by which they hear. God, I pray that you would, um, again, just be with our community and be with us as we go forth this week. As we sing one further song, we continue to pray that you'd be glorified with us, or sorry, that you would be glorified by us as you go with us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing one final song together as Lindsay leads us. I stand before you now, the greatness of your renown. I have heard of the majesty and wonder of you, King of heaven in humility. I bow as your
Thanks for being with us. You guys are dismissed.